Good afternoon. My name is Tom Apple. Uh, thank you all for coming out on this uh, sunny Sunday afternoon. And um, just give you a little bit of background. It was two years ago, this past Wednesday, that my wife and I first visited this area and visited the house that we bought up on Oak Level Road and, and moved out here from Suffolk. It's also two years ago this past Wednesday that I came to our first, my first visit to the Historic Society for a lecture on um, um, was it Joseph Clark, William Clark, I'm sorry. And um, so the last past two years has been quite an adventure moving out here and uh, I've joined the uh, Colonel Waller chapter of the um, Sons of American Revolution. And uh, so I've really enjoyed uh, being here, and uh, hopefully I can give a little bit of con contribution here today that you might, you might find interesting. So we're going to be talking about navigation in the age of sail. And a lot of this is going to be focused on the, the British contribution and the American contribution. But navigation is a very ancient thing. Lots of cultures, all cultures, pretty much indulge in navigation of different types. Um, from looking at the skies, would you hit the next slide, please? Uh, oh, you can slide me that. <laughs> touch, touch the pad there. You just hit this? Yep. Okay. I'm turn the volume on. Yes. So, so, ancient man has been staring at the skies, the heavens, since day one. And they've been looking up at the skies, wondering what's it all about. And they've been noticing patterns there. They see the, how the stars are arranged. They're arranged in groups. And these, these things don't change and move, and, except as the Earth spins. And so this created a lot of curiosity on their part, and, and on some part, religion. But the heavens have been kind of like a Actually, the first maps that were ever scrawled on a cave wall were not a map on how to get the Ogs Cave for the mammoth, you know, cookout. It was stars. It was the things that they could see from where they lived. And so mapping the heavens has been the first thing that really got mapped. Well before anybody mapped the land or the seas, it was the sky that they were looking at. So let's say, as I mentioned, lots of cultures looked at the heavens. Um, for an example, um, the Polynesian culture out in the South Seas. They're traveling from island to island, small specks of land on a vast ocean. And they're finding these islands and they're going back to other islands and going back again. So again, like I mentioned in, in the right of navigation is about how to get there from here and how to get back home. <laughs> so, and that's what the Polynesians were able to do. And they used a combination of the stars. And they also used natural phenomena to help them navigate as well. They looked at the water coming off of the islands, cloud formations over islands, um, the type of fish that they see in the water, the birds they see in the air, all these things could indicate the, the presence of, of a land mass. And they use this in their own rudimentary forms of maps to navigate from these little specks from one speck to another over many centuries. And so, you know, humankind is people, the face, whole face of the earth by intrepid explorers and people willing to go out there, you know, out into to the unknown and find out what's there, figure out where it's at and try and get back home so they can tell other people. Um, so, looking at the sky and trying to figure out what to make of it. Some of the first people to do that were the Babylonians, around 1000 BC. It's also the Babylonian, Babylonians who came up with the 360 degree circle. And having the circle divided up into 360 degrees, which we still use today, is kind of a really important part of navigation 
and, and uh, assigning direction and describing distances and things like that. Now, the Greeks took it a little bit further. Um, and and, and uh, the second century BC, Hypocarchus of Nicaea compiles the first stellar catalog of about 850 stars. And they're pretty, they're fairly accurate. Um, and he's using the information that they've learned from the Babylonians on 360 degrees and things like that. Um, also, they noticed that not everything in the sky moves the same way. Now, the stars pretty much stay in the same place as relationship to each other, but there are these other things that move in different directions. They kind of wander around the sky, and the Greek word for wanderer is planetes, from which we get the term planets. Um, and so they notice that these things in the sky move differently as well. Now, during the Dark Ages, after, after the fall of the Roman Empire, the, the, you know, things in the Western world weren't really geared up for science so well. And so things kind of just kind of stayed the same, not too, not too much happened. And during that time, the Islamic scholars and the Chinese and the Indians are doing a whole lot during that period. And one of the things that the Islamic strong, uh, scholars do is they improve the astronomic instruments, which we'll get into a little bit here soon. Um, and then Ulik Beg of the Tamurid dynasty um, creates a catalog of 994 stars. And these are fairly accurate as well. Now, during the Renaissance, the Europeans kind of get back into the game a little bit. And it starts off with Copernicus in 1543, and he de develops the theory of the heliocentric system. And the heliocentric system is one where the Earth is not at the center of the universe or the solar system, but the sun is. And this is very controversial. It gets him a lot of trouble with the church. Um, in 1598, a, a, a Danishman by the name of Tycho Brahe, he creates a catalog of stars of over a thousand stars. And this is the most accurate to date. And mapping the stars becomes very important to navigation. So once they've got the stars kind of figured out, the next thing to do is figure out how does that apply to the Earth. Now, to be able to map the Earth, you have to know a couple things. And one, is how big around it is. Now, I know Columbus was arguing with a lot of people that the Earth was flat back in the uh, 1490s, but well before that, um, back around second century BC, the Greeks knew it was round. And um, Erastenes writes the book on the measure of the Earth, and he figures out basically how to m measure the circumference of the Earth. Cleomedes, a little bit later, simplifies this method. And then in 1037, a, uh, a Muslim scholar by the name Al-Biruni Biruni, writes the Codex uh, Masudicus, which also goes into a lot of detail on navigation um, and also plotting where the stars are and, pl and, pl and plotting the circumference of the Earth because that becomes very important. So knowing the circumference is important and be able to, to establish your grid. And Erastenes, another thing he did was he came up with the system of latitude and longitude. Latitude being the lines going around the Earth, and, the, and they're also known as parallels because they're parallel to each other, and longitude, so that measure, latitude gives you your distance north or south, longitude gives you your distance east or west, and your lines of longitude converge on the poles. Um, so Hipparchus applied degrees to that, and Ptolemy 
um, improve the grid so he was showing as he got closer to the poles, the lines were converging. There's another diagram kind of giving an idea on how the degrees work. We start at zero at the equator, going up to 90 degrees at the poles, then going around on um, longitude, you start at zero at your prime meridian. All right, the next thing is, okay, so they figure out what they have in the sky, and they figure out how to um, plot things on land with longitude and latitude. And the next thing is they be able to apply the sky to the land is they have to be able to measure the sky. That's basically measuring the angle between different celestial bodies. So one of the first tools to measure, um, and, and basically what they're trying to do is they're trying to measure the height of the sun above the horizon at noon. And this is used to achieve, to figure out your latitude, which we'll, we'll go into in a little bit. And so the first people, the first device to use this is called the cross staff. Now the cross staff, one disadvantage is that you have to look directly at the sun. And on the cross piece, you line the top, the top part of the cross piece with the sun and you slide along the staff, which has degrees marked on it. And then you line the bottom edge of it with the horizon. So that gives you the height of the sun above the horizon in degrees. While this kind of works, it's not very a fine instrument because you're looking right at the sun to be able to do it, which can be rather blinding. Um, but they use it for a good while. The port it starts out, they invented in 400 BC. The Portuguese use it around, starting around 1515, and then William Byrne Bourne uh, prints a treatise on it in England in 1571. So it kind of, for a while, it was languished for being used for navigation, and then the Portuguese kind of brought it back into use. The next device designed to measure distance between the lights is the astrolabe. It's invented by Hippocrates between 220 and 150 BC. Um, Muhammad al Fazari in the 8th century AD refines it some. And then Geoffrey Chaucer, who you might know from writing Canterbury Tales, he also is into navigation and writes the treatise on the astrolabe. Now, the astrolabe. Basically, you have an arm here that, that pivots to, to aim at the sun to, to measure that angle of height. It's also equipped with these various discs that have lines that scribe on how to determine your latitude in, in different areas. And so um, they would have different sets of discs that they would use for different areas of, of the uh, sea that they would go to the, to, uh, to visit. And astrolabes continue to be made, well, there's still people making them now. <laughs> then, then the next kind of device is the backstab. This is invented by John Davis in 1594. And it's described in his book, Seaman Secrets. And basically the advantage to this is that you don't have to look right at the sun to use it. In fact, what you're doing is you're using the sunshine shining through a vein here to line up with this light, which you're aiming at the horizon, and then you're lining this one up here, and this slides on this scale, so that you could um, add together the angle to get your total angle between the horizon and the sun for your all-important all latitude measurement. So, and this gets, this is used quite late, well up into the 18th century. The next device is kind of based off something that Nicholas Copernicus had messed with, and that's a reflecting quadrant. And uh, John Hanley in 1730 in his book Seaman's Secrets describes making one of these. And I have a couple examples here which I can show you. Um, basically with this device, you're sighting through this sight and looking at this mirror here. And when you adjust this arm, you're trying to make the reflection of the sun shine up in one of those mirrors. 
And it's a method for, deter again, determining the height above the horizon. Now, one of the important things is that this little bone scale at the bottom is very accurately marked. And for a long time, people were doing that by hand. And then when you do something like that by hand, very precise measurements, uh, errors can creep in, which can cause errors in navigation. So uh, a gentleman by the name of Jesse Ramston um, invented a machine that would engrave all these things of uniform nature so that the accuracy could be maintained. So when you're looking at the quadrant, you're peeping through the site, and you're looking at the reflection mirror. So one half of the, of the site is clear, so you can see the horizon. And the other half has got a mirror that's reflecting off of your index mirror, which is the big one at the top. And what you're doing is you're moving that index arm until it looks like the reflection of the sun in the mirror is right sitting on, on the horizon. And when you have that, that's the height of the sun over the horizon. And again, that's, a, that's going to be important for determining latitude. So when you're taking your noon sighting, what you want to do is you want to measure the height of the sun at its, at its highest point. That's your solar noon. I mean, all of our clocks, 12 o'clock is noon, but if you look up on your, on your um, solar al almanac, solar noon's a different time. Um, it, it can be a half hour, 45 minutes off of your actual time. So for example, if we use our handy dandy nautical almanac, we can look up, and this was for the year 1778, we look up 26 May 1778, we do, let's say we did our noon sight, and we measured 72, 72 degrees and 31 minutes. And we look at the almanac for that date, it gives us a declination of 19 degrees and 34 minutes. Actually, it's uh, 17 uh, Got to type it. Seventeen degrees, <clears throat> twenty-one degrees, and eleven minutes. That's the, oops, that's the actual declination there. So to do the math, and this is the only math you got to do today. I swear, you start with ninety degrees. You subtract your nine, your noon sighting amount, which gives us seventeen degrees, twenty-nine minutes. Then you add your declination factor. If you're in your northern hemisphere, subtract it. Southern hemisphere which is here, we add it, and this gives us our exact position, which I think that's a little bit north of Lynchburg. <laughs> but you can see, if you have a nautical almanac and you have an octant or, or sextant or something like that, something that you can measure the height of the sun, figuring out your latitude is not that complex. Longitude's a completely different story. Uh, another tool, now the octant measures uh, up to one-eighth of a circle, and you can't do all of your astronomical observations with an octant. So they invent the sextant, which is very similar, but it has a larger arc on it, uh, a little bit finer um, adjustments as far as fine-tuning it and, and getting a little bit more precise readings on it. The sextant, which just recently the Navy started using again because can't always rely on GPS. <laughs> After uh, running the ship up on a reef in the Philippines and subs into undersea uh, mountains, they're finding that they need to use the sextant again. Okay, now we're getting to the 18th century. Now the 18th century is when things really start to kind of happen as far as navigation. And England does a lot, has a lot to do with this because being an island nation, they have to come, they're really dependent on, on navigation. And it really comes to a head in the year 1707. Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel has a fleet, British fleet in the English Channel, and they're heading back to England. And he makes about a 10 mile miscalculation on their longitude, which runs four ships up onto the rocks of the Scilly Islands. Um, the Association Eagle, Romney, and the Firebrand, which results in the death of about 2,000 sailors, including Admiral Shovel. 
Now, such a loss of, of people and, and material and things like that kind of shocked the British government a little bit. And they decided that they needed to get really serious about figuring out longitude. So in 1714, they come out with the Longitude Act. The Longitude Act is a cash award for a princely sum for anybody who could figure out how to, to, to determine longitude. So they'll give you 10,000 pounds if you could get within one degree of longitude, which is 60, 60 nautical miles. Um, 15,000 if you could get in within 40 minutes of one degree, which is within 40 nautical miles, and 20,000 pounds, which is equivalent to 2.96 million pounds today, which is probably close to $5 million today, um, if you get within 30 minutes or 30 miles accuracy. And the people pushing this was Sir Isaac Newton and Sir Edmund Halley. You might have heard his name from Halley's Comet. So there's this one fellow by the name of Neville Masculine. Now, Neville Masklin, he's a pretty motivated fellow. He's an astronomer, and he comes up with a, a method of determining longitude called the lunar distance method. He's also known for coming up with the nautical almanac and astronomical ephemeris in 1769. And this book here is a replica of the 1778 version, but it's full of all kinds of tables and things for making astronomical observations and for navigation. Um, and he's the first one that does, does one that's kind of universally usable no matter where you are on, on the Earth. A lot of them prior to that have been very locally oriented, but this one gives you information that allows you to navigate the whole world. Um, in 1765, he becomes the Astronomer, astronomer Royale. Now, the, thing, the lunar distance method is seemingly simple. Basically, you want, you're looking at the moon and a known star. And this one is using Regulus as an example. So they're looking at the altitude of Regulus, the altitude of the moon above the horizon, and the measured angle between the moon and the star. After that, it's about four hours of calculations to come up with longitude. Four hours of, of, of spherical geometry and trigonometry. So Neville Masklin, after he comes up with his nautical almanac, he comes up with the longitude short form. <laughs> this takes about, if you're good, about 45 minutes to an hour. Okay? Now, Neville Masklin, he's really hoping hard to get that 20,000 pounds award. Even though since he becomes astronomer, astronomer royale, there's a little bit of conflict of interest there because he's one of the people that evaluate the uh, offers. But it turns out he gets a little bit of competition. This competition comes from a carpenter, John Harrison. He's a carpenter and an amateur horologist, meaning that he's in the clocks. He makes clocks out of wood. And one of them that's in his parish church is still running from over 200 years ago. Because he uses um, um, tropical hardwoods for his bearings, which the oily woods make the bearings autom automatically self-lubricating. And so just playing around with wooden clocks, he he's learned a whole lot about this. And so he's determined, he's gonna figure out a way using clocks to determine what your longitude is. Now the problem with using clocks is that clocks at the time period use a pendulum. And you're on a ship that's rocking left and right, fore and aft, 
and pendulum clocks just don't work too well on a rocking ship. So he comes up with a chronometer that has all kinds of things to try and offset that. And this one, H1 is the first one. It's in a cabinet, probably about that big. It's a pretty big thing. And, it, and they take it out on board a ship, I think they go down to the Azores, and they meet with some limited success, but there's still some problem with it. It's, and the problem with clocks is that they gain time in summer and they lose time in the winter is one of the issues they have with it. It's the effects of temperature on the metals and materials in the clock affects how accurate it is. So he uses all kinds of dissimilar metals put together to try and offset all this thermal expansion and traction to make these clocks accurate. So then he comes out with his H2 clock, which is a little bit better. And then he comes out with the H3 clock, which is supposed to be even better, but even before they use the H3 clock, this friend of his in in introduces him to a, a watchmaker. He says, it's, man, you, you gotta meet this guy. He makes the best watches. And, and, and at first, Harris is not too interested. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm kind of busy. I'm, I'm dealing with clocks here, not watches. But he's interested in watches too somewhat. So he gives the guy a design of a watch he designed himself. and says, hey, can you make me this watch? So the guy goes and makes the watch and does a beautiful job of it. He gets the watch back, he's looking at it, and he's, the wheels in his head start turning. And he creates H4. Now, so all these other ones are big. Number three is maybe about the size of this podium, okay? So they're getting smaller progressively. H4 is about five and a half inches diameter. It's like a big pocket watch. And H4 works. Um, they make a copy of it, Kindle makes a copy of it, and Captain John Cook uses it on one of his South Sea adventure, uh, his explorations. And it works fabulously. And the awesome thing about a clock it's really simple. There's no 45 minutes or four hours of trigonometry involved. What you need, your clock is set to, to the time of um, Greenwich, England. And when you look at your local solar noon, you look at the time difference between your local solar noon and the time it is in England. And you look at that time difference, for every four minutes of time difference, it's one minute of one degree of latitude. So for every hour of time difference is 15 degrees. So for example, right now, like England, uh, time zone, they're five hours behind us. Five times uh, uh, 15, 45 degrees. Is that right? Yeah, some fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. But from that, it's a simple you know, mathematical calculation to figure out your longitude. There's no trigonometry anymore. It's all very easy. Now these early chronometers, like that, the H4 chronometer, was very expensive. It costs about one third the cost of the whole sailing ship. So at first, not too many people had them. But as more and more of them were being built, the price went down, the value was, was worth it because Fewer ships got wrecked on reefs, fewer ships got lost, you got to your destination quicker, it's a lot more effective. Now I'll talk about some American navigators. Benjamin Banneker, really interesting fellow. Um, his uh, mother was a, a, a free, free woman of color, his father was a freed slave. They believe his father may have been of the Dogon tribe, which is a coastal tribe in Africa who used a version of celestial navigation. And they believe it was because of his father's, his father's background that may have influenced his interest in navigation as well. Um, in 1753, much like uh, John Harrison, he made it his own wooden clock that struck the hour and based off of a pocket watch someone loaned him. So he, he's very much a, a technical kind of person looking at this. In 1788, he was loaned some books on astronomy, which he voraciously devoured. And by 1792, he's publishing his own um, uh, nautical almanac, 
Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia Almanac and Ephemeris for the years 1792. And he's published at least for six more years. And so um, he, he's one of the first American astronomers that's affecting and improving navigation for, for people traveling at sea. Then we have Nathaniel Baldich. Nathaniel Baldich um, uh, lives in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, his father's a seaman, alcohol problem. His mother's from a fairly wealthy family, though. It's through his, her family connections. He gets access to a library in town owned by several of the local um, businessmen. It's a private library, and because of that connection, he gets to go in there and he reads everything. In fact, he teaches himself differential calculus. He's one of only six people in North America at the time who can do differential calculus. In fact, Thomas Jefferson um, tries to um, lure him to teach at University of Virginia. In 1802, he comes out with the American Practical Navigator, which is basically the American version of Neville Maskelyne's um, novel Almanac. And the thing is, uh, Neville Maskelyne uses several people, what they call computers, to do all the calculations for that almanac. Um, Balich starts off with taking Maskelyne's almanac and correcting it, finding all the mistakes. And he figures, oh, this is too many, I'm gonna do it all by myself. So he does all the counts for this almanac by himself, because it's fun. He also, he also does a lot of other things. He does um, basically early office automation. He comes up with standard office forms, routing slips, contract forms, transmittal forms, all that kind of stuff you see, especially in government offices. He started it. Um, so, and uh, eventually the American Geodesic Survey take, takes um, ownership or buys ownership of the uh, uh, practical Navigator, and they, they publish it every year since. So that's a publication that's, that's still that's still being done. All right, Navigating Without Stars. Um, and that's called Dead Reckoning. And so that's basically, you're collecting data on how fast your ship is going, what direction it's going, um, how much it's sliding to leeward in, in, in its track, um, and collecting all this data to make an educated guess as to where you're at. And it's uh, dead reckoning. And so one thing you'll be using is the compass, the ship's, gimbal ship's compass, uh, to know your heading. On your ship, every half hour when the bell rings, you're writing down your reading on your log slate. And so it has, it's, um, it has the hour, how many knots, as far as your speed. Measuring knots is used, using a speed log. And that's this thing over here. It's a reel of line with a weighted wedge they call the chip. And basically, the lead weight on this causes this to float upright in the water. And they toss this off the back of the ship and let the line run out, um, usually about 100 feet, we call that the stray line, and get it out of the wake of the ship. And then um, there's a red mark on here somewhere. And that's where the knots will start. And at that point, there's a knot tied in the, in the line every about every 48 feet. And they have a sand glass. When they get to the red mark, if the line's painted over, they, they uh, capsize the glass to start timing 28 seconds. And the number of knots that pass through the guy's hand as a, as the ship's driving away from the ship is how many nautical miles per hour your ship is moving. Now, somewhere between those knots are roughly um, eight fathoms apart. So let's say, you know, it goes past one knot and you can measure it out with arm stretch, which is about a fathom. And so let's say you measured it at four knots um, and uh, five knots and four fathoms. That's basically four and a half knots. 
And also while that line is stretched out behind your ship, usually on the back rail of the ship, there's degrees marked so you can see how much to one side your ship's drifted because the wind's blowing it. And you look at that, look at your leeward motion, how much downwind your ship's sliding, because it's not going to be the perfectly straight line, it's kind of veering downwind as you go. So you also have to use your leeward motion um, in respect to uh, uh, where, you're, where you've actually gone, to calculate all that in. Now, you might have another piece of equipment called a traverse board. That's this thing over here. Uh, some people think that's used in lieu of the log slate, but I'm pretty sure from what I've been reading, traverse is for traverse sailing. That's when you're making lots of changes within your half hour period. So this allows for you to make you know, up to six measurements per half hour. So that if you're keeping shifting, your light wind, you're tacking back and forth, you can record all that information on that on this little board by putting pegs in the holes for the different speeds and directions so that you can keep an accurate track of that. And then at the end of the watch, that goes to the sailing master and he writes it all down in the log book. So dead reckonings, you're gonna use that when you can't see the sun, you've got bad weather, some something that prevents you from doing a, a celestial observation. So to talk about some of the tools a little bit more, um, this is what they call a Hadley Quadrant or an Octant. Um, this one's from around the 1760s. And basically, as I was mentioning before, it's used to uh, take your sightings. You have a peep sight here that you look through this mirror. It's that split half mirror, half window. Look for the horizon. And you, so you can slide this where you see the, the sun sitting right on the horizon, and then you can take your measurement. Now, one thing bad about this thing, you see how big it is? And you're on, on board a sailing ship, and you're trying to take a measurement and the wind's blowing. And so this has a lot of sail error. So over time, octants tend to get small. This is one from about 1810. And you can see it's a little bit smaller. It's made, this, that one was made out of um, African mahogany. This was made out of ebony. And has a little bit more details. On the back, you have a nice little pad, a notepad, where you can write down your sight, sighting um, heights. And it even has a little pencil holder in it to keep your pencil stash so it's nice and handy. Um, The um, octants also have what's called sun shades. And these are a set of three shades on this one, that one only has two. And basically that sunglasses or filters so you don't burn, you're not burning your eye out by looking at a reflection of the sun. Um, so I have up here a lot of the examples of some of these items. Um, if you have any questions, um, more than happy to answer them or, or, or go into greater detail and describe any of this gear. Yes, sir. How did the early sailors navigate before there was even paper? How did the, the um, anybody who took to a vessel, particularly in the Mediterranean, how did they navigate? Well, how did the Venetians find Tunisia? For example. Well, again, at that time, the astrolabe is probably your, your biggest uh, tool for using that. And the astrolabe was set up. Uh, the astrolabe had discs on there that had lines scribed on there that gives you the date. So if you know you line up the date with there, you didn't make your observation, and that helps you figure out exactly what your latitude was. They had no clue what longitude was. They, 
<laughs> that, that was quite a while before anybody got any kind of grasp of what their longitude was. Um, they made different, you know, looking at the, the moons of Jupiter, transiting behind Jupiter and things like that. They tried a variety of methods to try and, and nail that down. And a lot of, also a lot of what they use is what's called deliberate error. So you know a certain city is on a certain line of latitude. But when you hit the coast, you don't know if you're north or south of it. So you make a deliberate error of going like, say you deliberately go north of it knowing that when you hit the coast, we'll have to go down south the coast to find it. So there's a lot of trial and error going on, a lot of deliberate error going on. Um, and uh, again, Tunisia, you got things also similar to what the um, uh, Polynesians did, cloud formations form over islands, because the difference in the temperatures coming off the land than the sea. So they also use things like that. Um, they used um, uh, rudimentary forms of compasses and also use of Polaris, the North Star, for, for um, navigating. Um, when was a compass created? Oh, uh, compass goes way back. The Chinese are credited with the first coming out with the compass. When did it come to Europe? Uh, it came to Europe, I think it was right around the. Uh, during the Dark Ages or the Renaissance period, right around that time, it was, it was after the Greeks. But, um, and they first start out with, you know, the, the, the Chinese are putting magnetized needles on like a piece of paper floating on water, basically to act as a compass. And then eventually they start magnetizing, with, with a lodestone, magnetizing larger pieces of metal. Eventually they come up with a, a more fixed needle type compass that, that fits. Um, this one here, um, it's kind of interesting. It's, um, the, the compass card sits on a sheet of mica and it had magnetized wires on it. And I've used some different magnets on this one to, to make it work a little bit easier. But um, magnetizing the wires on the card um, was done with what would have been done with like a load stack. Tom, you said you had. Uh done some props for movies? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, Master and Commander, um, uh, Far Side of the World that was, came out um, with Russell Crowe. Uh, did a lot of props for that. Did the speed log reel like this. Um, we had a lot of people working, making leather buckets, wooden buckets, sea bags, pottery, glassware, all kinds of stuff. And. Um, I was able to hook them up with a vendor in San Diego that sold them the uh, octants that they used. Um, and did some stuff for some other movies like National Treasure and the first Pirates of the Caribbean, stuff like that. Um, Interesting that in spite that we have so much technology and we're doing so much CGI work that to make these movies fly, you've still got real craftsmen that are having to do some of the props and stuff. Oh, most definitely. That, that movie was, uh, I, I did props for a couple different movies, and that was the best one to work with because they were very meticulous about the authenticity of everything. And so they'd come onto our website and pick out stuff, and I'd go, no, no, that's something if you want this instead. Eventually, they would, they would send us up the list first because if we wouldn't do it, I'd tell them who could. But they went above and beyond on that film. For example, like the artillery, all the cannons he got with the group of Civil War, um, North-South Skirmish Association guys, that artillery piece. And so they made up all the different munitions from chain shot to bar shot to, to, to um, uh, uh, grape shot stuff. And they fired it into these stacks of pot pallets with microphones everywhere. So in the movie, when you hear a cannonball whizzing by, that's the sound of a real cannonball whizzing, whizzing by. <laughs> that they were What movie is that? Uh, Master and Commander. Um, it's a, a work of, uh, it's a fictional movie based on the works of Patrick O'Brien. Um, he writes, it's basically um, Napoleonic War, War of 1812 period, um, sea stories and uh, and that's an interesting book because he, he gets into a lot of the technical details of them, you know, 
doing their noon sightings and things like that and doing the mathematics. And that's one thing that was important for midshipmen to learn was mathematics. Um, the, the, um, and midshipmen who, eventually midshipmen who couldn't pass for a gentleman or something like that, who, who couldn't pass the exam for a lieutenant, um, what they would become is master's mates. So they would be the assistant to the, ma the sailing master. And then later on, if they never got their um, officer's commission, they, would, they might get a warrant as a sailing master. So a sailing master in the Navy was a warrant officer position, and they were in charge of the working of the sails and also for navigation. And so you would have uh, a set of assistants who are collecting data, for example, checking the speed every half hour or so, um, looking at looking at your headings, recording all that stuff down on the log slates, uh, keeping track of the of turning the, for example, that's a, a half hour sand glass that would be turned every half hour to sound the bells for keeping the clock on board the ship. Any other questions? Well, if you'd like to come up here and take a look at some of the, the stuff I've got here, you're more than welcome. Um, I've got some of the instruments here. I've got reproduction maps that I've done. If you want to see what the nautical almanacs look like, you're perfectly more than welcome. I really appreciate everybody coming out here. And uh, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thanks, Tom. Tom Apple. <laughs> Do come up while you got a chance, if you care to, and uh, see what we've got in the way of artifacts. Yeah, I've got some of the like drafting tools and things like that that they were using. Um, uh, Day-night telescopes, log books, that, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Well, we hope to see you all back once, once a month. We're here the third uh, Sunday, and if you uh, have trouble finding out what we're doing, you can check us out on Facebook or join as a member and we'll send you a note every time we have something going on. Thank you. East Town is here. You got the York River here and the York Town there. Now, it has Baltimore. But on, on the map are notes from various captains. That's what they did. The log books all get turned over to the Admiralty and all the information in the log books eventually get incorporated on maps. So it's got, not only has the soundings and fathoms, it tells you what's on the bottom, whether it's gravel or shell. And on, this, on the sounding lead over there, they would put a little bit of tallow in the base of it, so whatever was on the bottom would stick. So when they did their soundings, they would pull up the sounding lead and they would see, oh, it's shell or it's gravel or it's mud. Because it would stick to the bottom, to the tallow at the bottom of the sounding lead. Maybe I should have used this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just follow okay. yeah. I don't want to pretend I know anything about sailing. I grew up on Long Island, so we were always on boats. But, um, you know, growing up as a kid, they always talked about the Vikings. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the Vikings had a neat little gizmo called the sun step. Well, I was going to ask you about that because I had seen that on Yeah, the and it's basically so you can, because you're using the sun to help navigate. And so when it's really cloudy or hazy, when you move it from the sun, it becomes opaque. So basically, it's big to help you plot the sun. You recognize this place? Long Island Sound? Uh, yeah. That's Block Island. Yeah. 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 So this was drawn up by the master of the water in 1777. Wow. Well, yeah, Long Island was South Fork, North Fork, Plum Island, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we live over here somewhere.